um, for inviting me. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry that I can't be here uh, or can't be with you. Uh, my roommate has tested positive. Um, so that's the reason why I couldn't come. I hope, uh, and I know that usually the discussions afterwards are the best uh, when we are having a beer together. And also I would be very much interested in hearing what you are working on, you all, um, and having a more open conversation also maybe how to connect uh, philosophical inquiry with artistic practice. And um, yeah, I'm afraid that it probably won't be as lively via Zoom. So I hope there will be another chance um, to, to, to discuss these matters and for me to come to, to Munich and uh, yeah, just to discuss with you directly. Um, yeah, I also, I'm not quite sure how um, my talk will relate to the overall topic of um, assassination and, um, and the Munich uh, anniversary. I hope we'll find some way uh, to connect it. Um, what I want to do today is simply present you with this approach of abolitionism and uh, why I believe that it is a plausible political philosophy, um, why I think we should adopt an abolitionist framework um, to fight violence, overcome violence, especially uh, forms of state-inflicted violence. And then I will also, in the end, raise a few questions, uh, especially concerning the notion of democracy. Um, I don't know myself how long it will take, uh, maybe something like 30 to 40 minutes. And then afterwards, of course, I'm very um, happy to hear your thoughts, your comments, questions, and so on. Um, I, have a, I have a bit of a position paper um, that I put in the chat. I don't know if everybody received it. I will maybe... Uh, Post it again for those who came later. Give me one second. Um, so yeah, by by reading this this position paper, you can um, follow the structure of my talk a bit. Um, yeah, and I also have a, a PowerPoint. There we go. Can can you all see this? Um, yeah, I hope you can see it. Um, so abolitionism is, a, and if you have any questions along the way, by the way, please interrupt me and, and um, yeah, just uh, if I should slow down or if some, something was unclear or you um, have strong objections uh, already, then please uh, simply interrupt me. Um, so abolition, uh, especially the term abolition democracy stems, as Matthias already mentioned, uh, from the context of the a struggle um, for the abolition of slavery in the 19th century and um, yeah, in, in the United States. And it, the term abolition democracy was introduced by uh, the sociologist and civil rights activist W.E.B. Du Bois uh, in 1935 in his book, Black Reconstruction. And Du Bois uh, meant with this term abolition democracy, basically a very specific constellation of forces, namely um, uh, people who fought for the abolition of slavery um, in the aftermath of the Civil War. And the idea of, these, of this movement was simply um, to say that uh, merely being freed from the bonds of slavery is not enough. Yeah? Formal emancipation uh, is not enough uh, as long as it is not accompanied by also the uh, possibility to meaningfully shape and participate um, in, yeah, in, in political self-determination of a society. Um, and for the abolition Democ Democrats, um, this meant two things. It meant uh, political rights, uh, the right of rights of former slaves to participate in policy making, but it also meant economic rights and especially the right to, uh, to have property. The idea was that all like merely formal emancipation would be simply um, uh, lead to a re-emergence of slavery-like conditions by other names. And um, that therefore it is indispensable also to give the former slaves yeah, material conditions to shape their lives. Um, and uh, yeah, at roughly the same time, there were also uh, uh, even a bit earlier, um, uh, anti-colonial abolitionist struggles uh, with very similar arguments that uh, colonialism was uh, being seen as um, 
um, yeah, a form of violence, quite obviously, and that decolonization is not enough. Yeah, it's a very similar theoretical move. Decolonization is not enough if it is only a formal release from colonial bond, uh, and if it's not um, accompanied by political rights and economic um, possibilities. Um, uh, this picture uh, depicts the uh, Haitian Revolution, um, uh, the first revolution where former slaves themselves freed themselves from uh, colonial uh, bonds and from slavery, and uh, therefore the first uh, historical act of abolition. And again, the idea was to connect um, uh, 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 yeah, the, the, the aspect of liberating yourself from bondage um, with uh, creating new forms of uh, participation. So it's always not about simply um, you know, you know, being integrated into an existing society, um, but also um, abolition Democrats uh, demand changing the basic structure of that society. And this term abolitionism has then been picked up to and by, by other activists and, uh, and theorists to insist on the unfulfilled promises of this abolition movement um, and to um, yeah to to claim that abolition democracy is a still unfulfilled um, demand uh, and that um, even though there have been formal emancipations um, that uh, formerly enslaved people or formerly colonized people still have no meaningful or not um, um, sufficiently meaningful possibilities to actually um, shape their own lives in a material way. One, um, one uh, very prominent way of uh, yeah, insisting uh, on the uh, contemporary actuality of abolitionism was already in the 60s and 70s, the struggle for the abolition of death penalty, the death penalty in the United States and the death penalty until today. Um, is, uh, is a form of punishment that uh, quite uh, significantly um, uh, more uh, black people and people of color are suffering from than, than white people. So already in the 60s and 70s, the term abolition um, yeah, was still uh, um, an important um, element for, for a number of social and political struggles. And then, of course, in the last um, 10 years or so, and then especially uh, in 2020, after the murder of George Floyd and the uprisings in the United States, abolitionism has become a very prominent uh, term, especially in the Black Lives Matter movement. And so you see here uh, a number of different contexts and abolitionism has uh, since uh, been uh, yeah, expanded and extended to different um, uh, fields and, and domains, and it does not only designate uh, the abolition of slavery or of certain forms of, um, of state violence, but has become an umbrella term for a number of movements that struggle against uh, state-inflicted violence. So you see here, uh, of course, the burning of the Minneapolis Police Department, but abolitionists have also taken a stance against uh, prisons, uh, especially uh, the imprisonment of um, uh, political uh, militants. Um, there's also a uh, um, growing movement of border uh, abolitionism. Um, the camp uh, is one very uh, dramatic form of state-inflicted violence. Um, you see here uh, this demand, abolish ICE, which is uh, the American um, uh, Customs and Immigration Enforcement Agency. And, um, and of course, this whole idea of um, yeah, uh, 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 abolishing prisons, um, which, which is again, a, a very prominent uh, demand in this, um, in this movement. And the background here is um, that, uh, yeah, especially in the United States, both um, prison incarceration, as well as poli police violence, as well as um, uh, immigration enforcement um, significantly has a significant uh, racial differential mode of operation. Yeah, so um, mass incarceration, um, uh, um, black black people, uh, people of color are uh, uh, widely overrepresented amongst the prison 
population and the same is true also for uh, the victims of police violence and so on. Uh, so the idea is that the struggle against incarceration and the struggle against police violence stands still in this tradition of um, the struggle against uh, slavery. Um, and one uh, particular aspect, especially um, since uh, 2020, the Black Lives Matter movement is, I think, also the, um, the demand for the abolition of, of the police, uh, which is, um, of course, a very radical um, claim, a very radical demand, and very provocative that I think a few years ago was quite um, yeah, inconceivable that this would actually be uh, a real political suggestion um, uh, and that it would become prominent beyond maybe a small circle of radical leftist activists, but it has really uh, picked up steam. And here you see uh, the, um, the announcement of the Minneapolis City Council in 2020, who uh, decided with a veto-proof majority to abolish the police. Um, it was then put to a popular vote, and unfortunately, uh, it did not go through um, this, this initial plan to uh, defund um, the police and replace it with something else. But again, uh, quite I find it quite remarkable that the uh, abolitionist ideas of the Black, Black Lives Matter movement are now so visible and are at least a, a real political option. Um, and yeah, what I want to basically argue for in this talk is that this um, whole approach of abolitionism is a plausible approach of uh, reducing violence and that this has to, something to do with uh, de democracy um, more, um, more specifically. Um, I want to, before I, before I say more about democracy, I want to uh, quickly say something about uh, the specific political strategy uh, that abolitionists employ and that they regularly, frequently employ. Um, it's not simply a radical demand. <clears throat> it's not simply a um, political agenda. It's also a specific form or a specific notion of social transformation. So it's also... Uh, an idea about how to get from A to B. And abolitionist, um, abolitionists have often uh, used similar tactics um, to, to pursue these goals. Um, and I want to uh, yeah, show you two examples of abolitionist, of what I take to be abolitionist forms of politics, and then show what the specific um, idea of transformation um, they, they pursue. Uh, the first is oops, um, the Black Panthers. Um, the Black Panthers um, in the 1960s and at the beginning of the 70s in the United States were an actual social factor. So they did, uh, yeah, in 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 uh, in significant ways uh, control uh, large parts of large cities of the United States. So uh, it is very interesting to. Uh, explore at a bit more detail what exactly they did to unfold this power and um, and what the specific idea was they had um, how to transform the society. And you can see here again this double movement that abolitionists already in the 19th century employed. They also used these, this double movement in the 60s, namely a negative and a positive side. Yeah, So the negative side is trying to be to do to uh, withdraw from institutions of violence, especially police violence, and for this, um, yeah, it's important, which you see here in the bottom picture, uh, the armed patrolling of police um, units. So, Black Panthers would uh, accompany uh, police patrolling and make sure, so because they were themselves armed, make sure that the police could not as easily. Um, assault uh, um, the local population. So it was a kind of pushing back against forms of state violence um, and trying to be released from these uh, forms of bondage. But at the same time, the Panthers also, or the strategy of the Panthers also included a positive element in that they were also trying to create uh, both political and social forms of uh, of participation for people who were formerly completely marginalized and, and excluded 
from any form of um, yeah of social participation, uh, and uh, yeah very prominent are the survival programs that the Panthers started, especially which you can see here in the in the top page uh, um, uh, on the top of the page the free breakfast for school children, but the Panthers also um, yeah organized um, uh, legal counsel, free healthcare. Uh, for example, testing, wide, uh, widely available testing against um, uh, illnesses. So you have these two sides, the negative side of uh, pushing back against police violence and at the same time trying to come up with new institutions and new forms of or new ways and possibilities of social participation. Um, and this is, I think, uh, and, and the Panthers did this not by um, asking the state to do it or to provide this, but they uh, from the outside operated at a distance from the state. Yeah? So uh, for the Black Panthers, it was very important under this um, uh, term of Black autonomy uh, or Black power to unfold this form of power directly in the community rather than asking the state um, to provide for these, uh, for these goods. Um, and I think this is a very specific idea of uh, uh, or very, very specific for uh, many abolitionist um, tactics um, to operate at a distance um, from, from the state. Um, uh, another example is uh, feminist uh, tactics against sexual assault and uh, interpersonal violence, intimate violence. Um, and here uh, especially important um, is a group uh, um, of women of color called Inside, uh, Women of Color Against Violence, and uh, but also other groups, uh, Generation Five, and uh, Communities Against Rape and Abuse. These are all um, uh, organizations that formed in the last um, twenty to thirty years of uh, yeah women of color. Um, and the idea of uh, these uh, feminist practices was, um, or the starting point was to try to address problems of sexualized violence and interpersonal, int intimate partner violence in their communities without calling the police and without uh, referring to uh, incarceration as a solution. Because the analysis that they had was that once they call the police, uh, it does not solve the problem, uh, but rather uh, makes it worse. Um, and uh, so there was a, basically a double um, front uh, to, to fight against the violence in one's own community, the violence that is often perpetrated by men, but at the same time also to, to fight against the violence against one's own community. Um, perpetrated by uh, by the state and police and prisons and so on. So they tried to come up with new concepts and um, and forms of addressing these instances of sexualized violence that are often um, uh, that are often um, uh, uh, discussed under this idea of transformative justice and community accountability. Um, and yeah, we can of course uh, say more about this uh, later in the in the discussion um, if you if you're interested in this how exactly this works. But I wanted again just simply to um, use this as an example to show that again you have here a specific idea of how abolitionists um, pursue political change, namely first of all at a distance from the state, uh, not asking the state, for example, to provide. Um, more goods or provide uh, or to take care of a problem, but uh, do it in a way that is empowering uh, the community itself. And at the same time, also um, uh, creating and establishing new institutions and new forms of social participation. Yeah, so you have again this negative and this positive uh, element of it. Um, and I believe that this, these uh, strategies are, that, that you see in feminists of color, but also already in the Black Panthers, um, that they are very much um, spreading and that they uh, become more and more important for uh, a yeah, global international abolitionist movement and that we see similar tactics in, in a multiplicity of different 
fields. Yeah, so basically you see um, occupy kind of tactics. Um, this is the, the first picture is of uh, Freedom Square, which is a square next to the police department in Chicago where people occupied uh, the square and we named it and tried to live um, uh, um, yeah, for, for as long as possible without police and organizing their own way. The idea of mutual aid um, that you see here in the middle picture um, after uh, natural disasters and catastrophes where people um, yeah, with this concept of mutual aid help each other instead of calling um, for, for state and bureaucratic help. Um, uh, autonomous zones um, uh, occupy a movement and sanctuaries, um, um, the attempt to uh, protect uh, illegalized members of the community from deportation <clears throat> and um, uh, uh, create um, yeah, forms of safety for community members without the police. And all of these practices operate at the distance from the state and all of these practices um, uh, include this negative and this positive side. Um, and this is very, yeah, again, very specific for, um, for abolitionism uh, in that they uh, um, um, basically prefigure or anticipate in their concrete practices already what they want to um, see as a result of their practices. So it's not an instrumental notion of political strategy where I do something to reach a certain goal. Yeah? I go vote um, because I want to see a certain party in power. Um, but um, in abolitionist groups or in practices, it's a, it's a bit different, different because they try to already incorporate these ideals um, in their own concrete political practice. Um, I just want to read this one very famous quote by Ruth Wilson Gilmer, who is a very um, important abolitionist uh, scholar and author. And, uh, uh, and Gilmer says, abolition is not absence, it's presence. And so the idea is, um, if, if you hear, when you hear the word abolition, you often think, okay, something that's there yeah, should be abolished and then it's no longer there. So it's something that we imagine often as an event in the future. And after this event, everything will be different. But this is not how abolitionists uh, see it um, themselves. They believe that we that what we understand as abolition is already there, is already practiced. Yeah? And therefore, Gilmore says, abolition is not an absence, it's a presence, it's something that's already there. She says, what the world will become already exists in fragments and pieces, experiments and possibilities. So those who feel in their gut deep anxiety that abolition means knock it all down, scorch the earth and start something new, let that go. Abolition is building the future from the present in all the ways we can. Uh, so and I think these examples are very good, um, uh, very indicative of this idea of building the future from, from the present. Um, okay, but what, does this have to do with uh, with democracy and uh, um, and the idea of um, and, and, and yeah what what does it have to do with democracy um, and why did uh, Du Bois use this term abolition democracy not simply abolition um, and yeah this I want to argue now in the in the next uh, part of my of my talk why. Um, Abolitionism is not only directed against certain forms of state inflicted violence, but that it is actually important to uh, understand abolitionism as a specifically democratic practice or also democratic ideal. Um, and that it's not by coincidence that oftentimes abolitionists have referred to abolition democracy specifically. Um, and uh, I, I want to show this with respect or with the um, with the example of the police, but I think that this can also be um, extended to other fields like the prison or, or the camp, for example. Yeah? So oftentimes um, the police or state power in general is seen basically as the execution of the democratic will. Yeah? So we have this idea that um, the people decide something or the parliament decides something 
the democratic sovereign decides something and of course then it needs to be enforced you know, we have this idea that the police are only there to enforce the law and one first um, argument by abolitionists is that this is uh, not true that the police uh, do not enforce the law for a number of reasons uh, for a number of reasons and the first is that um, and I just mentioned two. Uh, the first reason is that oftentimes um, the the police, uh, who are only supposed to be the means to the end of the law, yes, they're simply um, uh, a means to enforce the law, and they should never become an end in themselves. But what actually happens uh, in reality is um, that this means emancipates itself from its end and uh, tries to. Um, um, deny or uh, um, refuse this democratic decision-making process. And this is a very, uh, I think, very clear picture where the new uh, mayor in New York, the now last mayor of New York, uh, Bill de Blasio, was, was freshly elected. And the police union, they all collectively um, um, turned their backs uh, towards the mayor yeah, to protest him. So you can see here that really the democratic um, the democratically elected uh, sovereign uh, is being disregarded by the exec executive's um, branch, uh, which of course uh, renders this whole idea absurd that they are there to, to simply enforce the law. Um, and there are a million other examples for this. Yeah, the police, be, uh, um, police commissioners who have their own political agenda, like explicitly political agenda. Um, um, maybe the most extreme cases. I live in Frankfurt and Hessen, where we have uh, every month a new scandal uh, about uh, Nazis in, in the police force. You, you have, of course, people who, police uh, officers who have an explicit political agenda, which might then uh, be anti, anti democratic, or very often is anti democratic. But oftentimes it's not as extreme and it's more subtle and it just simply takes the form of a um yeah chicaneries or harassment um that is not really uh the result of a political agenda but it's still something that can undermine this idea that the police is only there to uh to protect and enforce the law and the second the second aspect is um police power uh but also in general state inflicted violence um um, systematically and regularly and frequently undermines the standing of some of the um, of the citizens and therefore also undermines uh, uh, democratic equality uh, and yeah again one example of this is uh, the experience of racial profiling uh, it's a widespread uh, problem of the police and um, uh, this is something that is true uh, not only in the United States, it's also true in Germany. And this is an um, example of, um, of France. This is a picture, that image that has been, uh, is part of a campaign um, by a French um, initiative against racial profiling. And uh, you see here, yeah, these uh, three youth of color, how often they have been um, stopped by the police. Yeah, so uh, 70 checks um, uh, per year. And you see here Gilles, um, who is uh, 56, who has never been controlled in his whole life. Yeah? And of course, this difference, yeah, how often are you being stopped? How often are you being checked? And so on. Uh, you might say, well, it's not that bad. Yeah, you're just being checked. But of course, um, this is for a, a huge populations, um, a very important and dramatic um, experience to uh, see the state in such a way uh, that you're constantly being seen as a threat or constructed as um, as dangerous and and criminal and so on. Whereas others um, see the police not only not as a threat but also as a potential tool for their own interests. And this creates a form of um, inequality and a form of uh, separation and a split that again has an anti-democratic effect. Uh, so the idea that the police or in general state affected violence is part of a democratic system can be questioned. 
And this is, yeah, the first starting point of, of abolitionist critique. And, and in fact, um, um, after the murder of George Floyd, this has been really, um, yeah, productively dis been discussed and, and, and put forward also as a more general critique um, of, uh, of the police. Uh, and so what do, um, what do police abolitionists or prison abolitionists or in general state abolitionists propose is an intensification of, uh, of democracy. Uh, and again, this, um, these claims or this agenda has the two sides that I've already mentioned uh, uh, oftentimes. Yeah? So you have on the one hand, the idea of um, abolishing the police, abolishing the prison, getting rid of forms of state violence, but not in that sense that you first have something and then everything else stays the same. So you basically just take one factor out, but to combine uh, this negative side, uh, withdrawing or defunding or divesting from the police, combine this negative side with a positive side and create new forms of social cultural, political, economic uh, participation. Uh, and um, the idea is often to defund the police and to reinvest these resources into, for example, healthcare, into social housing, into uh, uh, drug prevention uh, uh, programs, into uh, community intervention programs, and so on. So that, um, yeah, certain resources are now free and they can be reused um, in different ways. Um, the vision for Black Lives, which is the uh, basically the policy or the uh, initial policy platform of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, has these two aspects uh, everywhere. So you're on one hand, you have the end the war on Black people, so a negative um, pushing back against forms of state violence, but it also includes ideas such as community control and political power for disenfranchised and marginalized communities. Um, so this is why I say on the position paper that abolition democracy is a socialist form of democracy because it also um, is not only a formalist, a formal democracy in that sense that everybody can simply participate or vote or um, has certain rights, but also ha to have the material possibilities and the material conditions of actually doing so. Uh, so this, I think, is um, uh, is a very important second aspect of abolition democracy. So you have an abolition democracy that operates at a distance from the state, which is very partic particular. And at the same time, it is not only formal, it is also, also socialist. Um, yeah, and, and at the end, I also want to mention a few, um, for me, open problems or um, open challenges um, and one, um, yeah, maybe directions in which we have to uh, think this term of abolition democracy further. And um, the first is that I think that oftentimes abolitionists or the abolitionist discussion remains on this um, socialist or material side of democracy to say, for example, we need uh, forms of social participation, healthcare, housing, and so on, which I think is very important and it's oftentimes overlooked. But um, to, up to, uh, to date, the abolition, is, abolition um, movement has not really focused also on the, law, on the role that the law uh, can play within an abolitionist conception. And uh, my suggestion here or my proposal would be um, to think abolition democracy not in that sense that it is simply a, an overcoming of all forms of law, and that is also not a disregard of the formal elements, for example, of emancipation, but that uh, references to the law are actually still important for abolition de democrats. Yeah, and you see here the Black Panthers who stand under this um, uh, under this, uh, uh, this claim where law ends, the tyranny begins. And this is actually a court building. And it's quite interesting that they um, yeah, not reject this claim, yeah, this, this bourgeois um, uh, legal claim, uh, but they 
uh, appropriated for themselves. Yeah, so they say, well, this is actually what we are doing. Yeah? We are the ones fighting against tyranny, and we are the ones fighting for the law. But in order to um, to actualize the law or to free the law from this tyrannical elements, we need to uh, think it against itself. And one way of thinking it against itself is um, by uh, freeing the law from its own ex police execution, yeah? to come up with an idea of how can we think a law, how can we think a form of um, coordination of rules of collective decision making or self government and so on, without uh, the violence um, that is represented in the forms of um, uh, of legal execution, such as the police or the prison. And one way of how to combine it, I think, is um, to uh, uh, um, think of forms of collective deliberation um, that can do without uh, legal coercion uh, and uh, can, can do without this idea of enforcement. And this seems, again, very utopian and unrealistic, maybe, um, that it should be possible to have a law but not enforce it. And this is basically my last uh, suggestion for today. Um, that uh, we can uh, think of a law or a form of uh, decision-making processes that um, generate different forms of binding energies. And here I, I use this quite um, yeah, unsexy term by, uh, by Habermas, yeah, binding energies um, that are set free through uh, collective deliberation processes itself. Yeah, you can think of maybe your class or um, discussion in your in your flat share or whatever kind of discussion that whenever you are um, participating in this discussion or in decision making process um, you are more likely to um, follow this rule even though um, you might be initially against it yeah so simply by by uh, uh, by a virtue of being included, this by itself generates a form of binding energy in that sense that if we are included in the decision making process, we are more likely to comply with the rule that has been decided, um, rather than if the same rule would be imposed on us by an outside um, uh, yeah, by an alien instance. Um, so the abolitionist perspective here is that if we um, recreate our society in such a way that we intensify uh, democratic decision making and also multiply um, the venues of democratic decision making um, so that people can actually experience actual real power about their own lives and that they have the feeling that or we have the feeling that we can actually decide something meaningful in our decision making that this will also lead to um, a decrease um, in the need of coercion and force uh, and that then uh, other forms of social integration that are uh, communicative in nature rather than uh, violent um, can take place, um, can, can take their place. Yeah, so uh, um, that was basically my, my suggestion that we should adopt an abolitionist framework to um, also fight against the uh, racist forms of state inflicted violence that are still uh, prevalent in our societies. Um, I think we, we cannot, there's simply no alternative to um, to fighting these forms of violence. And, um, but I believe that abolitionism as a movement has already provided convincing ideas of how to do that without simply accepting interpersonal or uh, pre-political forms of violence. Um, and one way of how to understand this is by um, thinking about the idea of democracy in a different way. Uh, and I've tried to 
argue that this new idea of democracy can, the, that we can conceive of it then at a distance from the state, that it should include certain social elements, not just formal elements, and um, that uh, it can forego uh, um, referring to force and violence as a means of execution, but that it is rather... <laughs> somebody is not muted. Um, but that it is uh, rather a form of um, uh, democratic decision making that can generate their own binding energies. Okay, so I'm now um, very much curious uh, to hear what you what you have to say uh, about it and what your thoughts are. And I hope I uh, was able to make myself um, uh, understandable. Um, yeah, so much from from my side. Uh, yeah, thank you, Daniel. I will uh, maybe have just one point from my side first, and then we open for questions. Because during the, the lecture, you said uh, at this page, when you talked about transformative justice, mm -hmm. um, that you can expand more. And um, I would be very curious already in the beginning to have maybe some sentences more of these examples, because I mean, there's a theoretical in the very practical sense of abolishing the police. And in the very practical one where you think about there's no police, but something where you would need police is done differently that would be i think interesting to see examples yeah. um yeah uh, i mean there are a number of um, of resources that you can look at and i will um, maybe later um, post a few links uh, in the chat uh, for those who might want to take a closer look at that but as i said the idea was uh, and that was developed by uh yeah women um, of marginalized communities who had no access to um, to the police. Yeah? So the, the option of calling the police in these cases was simply not there uh, because they are, their feeling was that the police does not make the situation better. Yeah? So um, locking people up uh, does not solve the problem. Um, oftentimes uh, when calling the police, they would arrest the woman who has called the police, yeah? situations like this. Um, police people um, have been harassing uh, the victims of sexualized violence. So the idea was, okay, we come up, we have to, we have to find our own way of dealing with this rather than calling, calling the police. And the idea of transformative justice is a bit of, um, um, yeah, tries to do that. And it's not like a, a catch-all recipe yeah, where you can say, well, I'm simply doing that, but there are certain... Um, fundamental premises of this concept. And the idea is always to center around the needs of the survivor yeah, and see what is, the actual, what is the actual need of this person who has experienced, for example, intimate partner violence. And oftentimes um, women do not want, for example, necessarily, uh, I mean, oftentimes it's about simply not having to see um, the, the perpetrator again and trying to exclude him for a while uh, from, uh, from shared spaces. Sometimes it's about childcare and uh, um, uh, sometimes it's about uh, yeah, finding a new uh, apartment or something like that. People who, or, or it's about emotional and um, support. So this is at the center of this process. And then the idea is, first of all, transformative justice in that sense that uh, we cannot speak of a restorative justice in that sense that we should go back to a situation prior of the deed where everything was good, but that um, really addressing the root causes of, for example, sexualized violence would mean also to transform the situation altogether. Yeah, that's one principle. And the other principle is community accountability to say that it's not simply something between two people yeah, who are involved, but that there's a larger community also involved and that they are also responsible in trying to make the situation right again. And oftentimes processes um, yeah, involve also the, um, the, the, the person who did the harm, yeah, so the perpetrator, um, in, uh, and, and attempt um, for, for them to take responsibility of the, of, the, of the deed, often to apologize and to try to change their behavior and 
um, form groups. I mean, practically, this is sometimes being done by forming two teams or two groups, one that is working with a survivor and see what, what their needs are, and, and one group that is working with a perpetrator, see um, what, what they need in order to reflect on and change their behavior. Um, but all of this, of course, is very schematic now um, and, and very rough, and oftentimes these processes fail and don't work and so on. So I'm not saying, I'm not advocating this as a catch-all solution, uh, but I'm, I, I, I was just trying to say that there are already um, discourses and experiments um, around, for example, um, uh, addressing sexualized violence, um, which of course often is the gravest, is, is the most urgent case yeah, that sometimes we have, okay, what do we do with the rapists? It's often a question that you that you get when you propose something like abolishing the police. And the response of, of these initiatives would be that the police don't solve the problem now uh, at all, yeah, so that we have to come up with, with solutions anyway. Um, yeah, I, I would, had, would have more, but maybe we open as well a bit up for uh, the group first, no? Or we should expand on this more. Maybe as to to get deeper to the point, I, I'm thinking since yesterday about an example that a friend told me. Um, they are studying in Vienna, arts as well, and they founded a collective um, without uh, telling their clear names on Instagram to somehow with the approach of a self-justice inside the art community in Vienna to address a harassment in the art field. And now they're themselves facing um, lawyers coming and the police attacking them because uh, they've been, um, they, they're questioned about and so on. And it's an example where I'm thinking about if you want to really start the abolishment as a movement, as a practical thing, I can imagine to start at these laws that you maybe open the fields a bit more for these more private ways of justice. But on the other hand, of course, it feels very, it feels very legitimate for us as uh, the civil citizens, uh, as we are somehow influenced, to not allow uh, this way of self-justice so easily. Um, yeah, I mean that's a very, that's the very big point I think to address my big first feeling about abolishing the police and as well probably a lot of people would share this in the beginning um yeah i mean uh, as i said this is often these are often quite messy processes yeah and 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 the problem that you're describing um certainly like appears in in different forms yeah that at some point you then do have to deal with the state in different in different ways uh, after all um uh, i mean the the ideal situation that you often find in in texts that are describing for example transformative justice processes is that all that everybody is member of one of the same community yeah um so it's about the the person who's doing the harm and the survivor are both members of the same community so that um, the, the perpetrator is in some way um, accessible for this kind of process, yeah? so that they um, might be addressed or, or that, that it is possible for them, for example, to exclude uh, if, if the person does not want to change behavior or does not want to take accountability, they can exclude them and this will provide already a certain basic form of safety for the, for the survivor. Um, but it's of course much harder if the person is not part of that community and is somebody from the outside and um, then, then they're often not available also for transformative justice processes. Um, and this seems to be the case in the case that you're describing that then you know, they suit the other ones. So that simply, yeah, then, then of course, that's not, and not a transformative justice process is possible under these circumstances, but still um, the question remains, I, I don't know what happened in this case, but if, if for example, a woman was um, the victim of a certain assault or um, uh, yeah, kind of um, toxic or harmful behavior, um, I think an abolitionist idea would to look at 
what are the concrete needs of this person in the first place yeah and and uh, sometimes it's simply revenge yeah it's a form of okay i want to um i i i know want to hurt this the, the person who has done this to me but sometimes it's also um more something more concrete or more um like uh you're not experiencing this again you know or trying to find spaces where um i can be safe or you know economic things and so on so i think the the task for the community would be to really seriously first of all create a condition under which the survivor can articulate and even explore their needs and then work um uh work to fulfill these needs and i think very very seldomly calling the police or involving the police helps with doing that of course there are many reasons to still do that yeah and i'm not saying well don't do it um uh um the the woman might have other motives also it's good to have this person on record and so on but for for many women of color this is simply not an option yeah because oftentimes they fear um uh, being even more and and i think this is also yeah the uh, the women's movement in germany has already discussed this in the 60s and 70s that oftentimes once you are in touch with or get in touch with state institutions this leads to re-traumatization yeah you a victim blaming you're being questioned or your narrative is being questioned and so on so idea already in the 60s was to establish for example autonome frauenhäuser yeah autonomous uh, women's shelters um as an alternative to say well we are like materially trying to really provide meaningful alternatives and say and, and safe spaces for women rather than waiting for the state to do something and this is this is simply the idea behind this and of course practically in the practice there are a million things that can go wrong and uh it's not and and oftentimes you know the person who did the harm will continue to do harm um it's not like a, a harmonious reconciliation at the end um i just meant that that you know this is a different perspective about and 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 often i think abolitionist groups have tried to reimagine what justice would look like in these cases yeah and justice oftentimes also for the survivor does not mean that you know calling the police uh, justice is not is very seldomly um this leads to a situation where the survivor can say well i have i'm now satisfied you know oftentimes um different strategies are much more likely to to um empower the survivor i would say yeah that's a good i mean of course i uh, this is my this is my perspective i'm also curious to hear others yeah um, and i speak from a certain yeah, very <laughs> i mean male perspective uh, here and um i'm i'm trying to you know simply report what how i understand these tra transformative justice feminists but of course others might have other experiences and other takes on this okay uh, so i see a, a question um, from florian yeah i would have a question uh regarding what you mentioned about the black panthers like the uh dynamic that there was a uh, radical group or a radical wing and uh more like how to say democratic wing or uh perspective that is more accepted by the majority of society i'd say uh my question would be um how how important do you think that um social movements right now i'm thinking for example on also on um extinction rebellion which has the claim to be completely uh pacific uh, pacifist um how important is also to have to uh a way of an, another agenda to to raise your goals or is do you think uh in other words do you think uh purely um non-violent non-radical way um has even an option to change something <laughs> It's very yeah. It's a good question. Uh, thanks. I mean, with the Black Panthers, I I'm not even sure if I would describe it um, uh, like that because 
I think the more militant wing or the people who were patrolling with guns were the same people who were also organizing uh, the breakfast for children. Yeah? And sometimes organizing a breakfast for children can be seen as radical and provocative as having a gun. Yeah? If a white person has a gun in, in the United States, it's not provocative at all. But if a black person has a, has a gun, it's being seen as a threat. And I think it's the same with handing out free breakfast or setting up um, health clinics and so on. That there's always this like how much you're being seen as a threat or how much you're being seen as radical does not only depend on your tactics it also depends on pre-established notions and biases and uh, yeah and racism and so on so um i'm not sure if that's um if that was the case for the for the panthers of course they afterwards they changed the tactics after a while in the 70s and then they also start for example participating in elections and and in some communities in oakland or san francisco um, there are black panthers in the city councils i'm myself not sure which I, or actually i would say the earlier more militant phase was more successful in that sense yeah because it opened up completely new imaginations of what a society can be like and also uh, in terms of the empowerment of these communities i think the more militant ways were more successful of course they had their own problems which come from for example uh masculinism or being um or undemocratic structures internally and so on but um that does not complete not uh um it's not the result simply of they are they being too radical or they are being too too militant i would say um and with extinction rebellion i mean is of course i mean i don't i don't um claim to solve this problem and the problem of this discussion of violence has been going on for a very very long time on the left and i'm not sure if i can add something meaningful i just wanted to say that i think this idea that non-violent tactics are more acceptable and that you will reach more people if you stay nonviolent. I, I am not sure that's true. Uh, I mean, of course, there are people who would rather go to a demonstration if, if they do not have to expect, for example, police violence. But at the same time, you also lose people with this kind of strategy. Like, I know that, that um, there was this one demonstration by Extinction Rebellion where they were handing out flowers to police and and we're singing like we love you and uh, and we're trying to to embrace the police and i had a discussion with friends and especially um yeah i know many people of color who who experience racial profiling on a daily basis but also maybe more radically thinking people then say okay but then i'm no longer part of this like if you if you love the police, then I can no longer be part of it. Uh, so it's 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 kind of a then you have to decide yeah which kind of which uh, segments of the society do you want. <laughs> of course, that doesn't solve your problem that you meant. But I I I I, I am afraid I have no more to say about <laughs> violent tactics. Thank you. Okay, there's one more question. Just a second from this room. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for the lecture first. I would like to understand or to ask you because the examples you used um, throughout the whole lecture was US referred or referring mm -hmm. to the US. Um, I would like to understand, like, first question would be why um, you chose examples from the US. And the other thing which came to my mind is um, transferred to Germany, transferred um, the idea of abolition democracy to Germany. I thought of the term basis democracy, which is not, um, not a new idea. Um, is it, is it uh, similar? Is it the same? Or like basis democracy, I think I trans translated it to English says grassroots democracy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would like to ask you 
is it the same thing? Are we talking about the same thing? If we're talking about abolition democracy, where are the similarities or where are the differences? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I should have said that in the beginning, um, you're, you're absolutely right. It's very US centric, my, um, my whole take. Um, and there is also a problem in that, of course, with transferring these experiences and also these debates to a European context. Um, the reason was simply that first the the problem is so much more visible in the United States. Yeah, it's just the mere the sheer number of people who are being killed by the police, for example, are much higher than than in Germany. Um, and also the discussion is much more advanced, I would say. Yeah. So the, the Black Lives Matter, and I, I found this very interesting that in 2020. Um, you saw also in Germany a rise in Black Lives Matter um, demonstrations in solidarity with George Floyd, whereas similar cases that happened in Germany did not cause such, uh, such a movement. Yeah, so sometimes it needs this detour. Um, and, and I think that's also something that always has been very important for the Black Lives Matter movement to say that the, it is an international movement Yeah, where people um, learn from each other and are inspired by each other. And I think that is still, that's also the case for abolition democracy and also for contemporary critiques of the police, that it is not the same situation here, but I find it still inspiring to look at certain uh, discussions. Um, there is, coming back to the very first question um, by Matthias, for example, uh, the Transformative Justice Collective Berlin, yeah, they try um, uh, exactly try to um, adopt transformative justice theories that have been developed in the United States and apply them to a German context. And I, I think that's something that oftentimes happens, that there's a form of transfer or translation in different contexts. And um, that's what I find interesting, simply, without uh, saying that that it's the same situation, of course. Um, and your question about uh, basis democracy, I would say it is similar in that I think um, there's a grassroots aspect to abolition democracy. Uh, it's something that is local and, and comes from, uh, from the bottom up. It's not necessarily a state-centered form of democracy. But what I find um, uh, lacking in many Democ many discussions or radical democratic discussions in the European context is exactly the question of how do you, what's your position on, on police and on, on, on state forms of violence or coercion and enforcement and so on. And oftentimes, um, yeah, grassroots democratical discussions or in general radical democratic discussions stop there yeah, and say, well, we need to have a more radical forms of democracy in that sense that more people are included or that we, for example, don't only vote, but also um, have more have city councils or whatever, which I all support, but they don't really question the power of the police to then enforce these decisions. And I think that's, that's a mistake. You really have to um, stick with this question, with this really difficult question even if we have the perfect democracy that's super inclusive and that's super, um, yeah, I don't know, that, that in, involves everybody and so on, do we want to have police in our utopia? Yeah? Do, we want, um, uh, um, uh, do we want people in, um, uh, that have to become policemen yeah, or police officers yeah do we want these these people to be part of our community and i think that's a question that i see only asked or mostly asked in the us context and not so much in the european context and without yeah saying that they are completely different there is a um, okay yeah. <laughs> there is a sentence in the in the chat saying, by the way, during the talk, people of color have often been named as such, but the talk missed to mark white people as such. I don't know if you want yeah. to make a comment on that. 
uh, yeah, I mean, if that was the case, um, uh, I, I apologize. That was not my intention to, I mean, of course, that's what, what oftentimes happened, yeah, to have like white, uh, the white position as the normal position, the neutral and objective position, and then uh, people of color are like the, the other. Um, um, and I think if, um, if, we are, if we painting a picture that does that, we are missing something important also about police. So that was not my intention to do that. I think if we look at police, for example, um, this this um, this one picture I showed about the um, three uh, three youth of color and the one uh, black uh, the one white guy um, showed this really uh, uh, well that it's a differential mode of operation. Yeah, so it works different for people of color and for white people. If you only understand it, if we, if you not only look at the experience that uh, people of color make, but also look at the experience uh, that white people make here. Yeah, and for a white person, um, you're not only not subject to police violence, but you're also uh, always being signaled that black people or people of color are a problem. Yeah, and you're always being signaled that you yourself have nothing to worry um, from the police and you can even call the police yeah, if you feel threatened. And, and I think this really is important to keep in mind the ways that the police address themselves to a white uh, um, perspective because this is what enables white people to identify with the police so much yeah, and to take over this police perspective and to defend police actions and so on. And it's also, I think, why it is so hard to make sense of a critique of the police, because many many white people um, identify with this perspective. And I think, yeah, uh, Marco is, is quite right in pointing out that it is super important also to um, mark and to uh, um, um, scrutinize uh, this, this experience. Are there any more questions or comments? I would be interested in hearing something about art as well. Does <laughs> does anybody uh, uh, believe that this um, is this relevant for anybody's work, like artistic work? Because this is this is an abolitionism also a. Um, a long-standing discussion, not discussion, but I mean, um, often yeah, this, the importance of artwork in terms of helping us to reimagine, reimagining society, um, also to um, this, this, this idea of storytelling, uh, finding alternative forms of narratives about what is going on and so on. This is super emphasized in abolitionism again and again. Um, but I, again, I think that's more maybe the case in the US than in Germany, but I would be interested in if, if anybody has, I don't know, worked about this before already, or if this is completely new to you all, or does it seem ridiculous, or is this something that informs your work? Yeah, to, I can make a start what, I, what comes to my mind because I'm recently focusing a lot on documentary formats mm -hmm. and um, researching about Brazil and it's always in my mind to think about more precisely how to observe because the whole topic I think what is connecting it to maybe not art but cultural practice in general is that visibility is an important term in the whole concept of yeah. transformative justice and of um, yeah, as you see in the Black Lives Matter movement, for sure, and how Instagram and other social media things have been used to expand it, to make it big and so on. Um, of course, when you produce images, and that's basically something art is doing, you take part in this grassroots uh, perspective of something is not, I mean, not enforced from top down, but it's somehow growing. Um, but at the same time, there's, of course, a politics of images which you, as well, working as an artist, you cannot uh, you can't escape from the logic that your images will fall to a certain like engine, to a semantic process logic that transforms them to 
Um, I mean, that's why I was thinking when the Black Lives Matter demonstration have been in Munich or in Germany, Instagram algorithm showed me a lot of bit weird pictures, a lot of white people demonstrating for Black uh, Lives Matter, but not showing me the Black lives somehow. And these are all questions I think they are very related to people doing art in the sense of publishing images or, uh, yeah. But as well, I mean, to focus more on this precise question I mentioned before about Brazil is because you always talked about radical democracy, a term I know mostly from Chantal Mouffe's and La Claus book named same, but um, and they are as well talking a lot of or um, questioning the point that there could be a left populist movement. But at the same time, you see in Brazil, for example, weapons are legalized now or much, much easier than before from Bolsonaro. And a lot of people buying it are somehow from this uh marginalized groups or they identify themselves with these groups mm -hmm. uh, with the same logic but but driven from a very right-wing populist um yeah signature politically so yeah that's a, it's a thing i was thinking about the whole time in with the trump radical democracy what you would say more to this question of a of of, of a left populism or because it's obvious what chantal move is always saying you don't see it and somehow she there was this quite, um, yeah, quite uh, controversy thing, I think, in France in 2016 or something. She was claiming for a left populist uh, countering um, Marie Le Pen. And yeah, uh, I mean, it's a more abstract or more theoretical topic, but yeah. yeah. Well, it's not, it's not so theoretical, it's quite, quite a practical. It's just, I mean, I, I have a certain position which I think is probably not the majority position in abolitionism. Um, so I think if you if you would pursue a, a pure abolitionist perspective or, or stance, um, then there's a certain or quite some skepticism about uh, left populism, I would say, because um, left populism is a strategy that is uh, centered around and directed at um, taking state power. Uh, and and that I think many people are very skeptical about that because, First of all, it often leads to movements becoming less radical yeah, once they engage with the state and they're being uh, domesticated and pacified. And um, you see this in the Green Party, but yeah, um, in, in all kinds of, of formerly left-wing party that there's a certain form of integration. And also in terms of um, uh, uh, fighting the violence of the state yeah so even if it would be possible to take over the state um, uh, and you pursue different policies oftentimes it still leaves um, those communities that are particularly marginalized they uh, often do not really benefit from these kinds of reforms um, but that's that wouldn't be my position i i think um we need a form of division of labor yeah? that, that there is uh, both that there is people uh, and parts of the movement that are working within institutions and um, towards institutions and that there are other forms of opposition outside of institutions um, that that uphold the pressure and also um, yeah uh, uh, establish these experiments that that they are talk talking about and that there can be a form of mutual um yeah pro a productive relationship of fr maybe friction but also of constructive solidarity and yeah in in the german context um some of the reforms um or police reforms uh, would not have been possible yeah without people um mobilizing also for elections and um i mean for example in both both in berlin and in bremen um there have been new police laws that um are really have improved the accountability of the police and that's of course not abolition um but it makes the life of many people much easier uh, and, and therefore i think we should not underestimate also this strategy um, Chantal Mouffe herself, or, or I think her position herself, is quite anti-abolitionist because she believes that this is too, um, I don't know, 
uh, childish anarchism. Um, yeah. But there's dogmatism, of course, on all sides. Yeah. I was, I have another, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, another thing I was coming to my mind is, um, as of course, thinking about Chantal Mouffe and it's as well focused on America, especially South America, and I understand some of the logic because as well culturally we are informed about what is happening there. For example, now in Chile, there's a uh, left-wing president. Um, but I'm thinking about um, the Chinese societies, uh, the Asian societies, like main, the main China mostly, Mm -hmm. um, because you never hear about this, but talking to people from China, you often have, you see similarities in the political system that are rather um, bottom up uh, mm -hmm. working. For example, when you talk to Chinese people about the anti-COVID measures, how it is enforced, a lot works with a um, somehow convincing, convincing logic with a permanent I mean, there's this city government, which is somehow not the police, but a, like part of the people um, that are ringing the doorbells and informing people, but a bit too annoying, of course. And of, of course, we tend, I think, as well in the broad media to always see it from the beginning as, the, as a very um, strange and uh, very uh, different political system. But somehow it would be interesting maybe, or maybe there's more uh, on this to, to compare these fields because it could be in fruitful maybe i don't know but is there some uh topic? i don't i simply don't know i'm sorry i i am not familiar with the with um with the chinese situation too much uh i think i mean in terms of abolitionism there this is such a global uh, black lives matter yeah? that's such a global movement that it would almost be impossible for me to conceive of that there wasn't some form of movement also um, yeah, in, in Asian countries and in, in African countries and in Latin American countries. Um, in, in Latin American countries, it's certainly the case. I don't know about Asia and I also don't know about China in particular because um, uh, yeah, of course the situation is completely different. I mean, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, and also of course the whole, um, yeah, the histories are different and so on. But if you look at, for example, the Occupy movement, yeah, the same was true then, yeah, that you had a completely different situation. And of course, the situation in China was not comparable to what was going on in New York. But still, there was a kind of transnational uh, translation of um, even from the Arab Spring to New York and then from New York to um, all kinds of different contexts um, that I think yeah, in some way, there is still a form of um, of communication, uh, even if it's only symbolic. And this whole idea of fighting police violence and trying to coming up with a utopia without police, I would imagine that this is something that takes place everywhere. But I simply I cannot I cannot uh, justify this claim. That's really just an assumption, and of and probably it's just really. Uh, uh, um small and local yeah. i mean because in the last years it was quite uh, it, it was becoming much more that you have been reading about as well japan and how COVID measures are working and there was always in the in the newspapers like ah it's better there and so on i mean this is this narrative um because this society i mean this i was reading it a lot and it's quite normative in a sense i'm not sure if it's true but you were always reading the societies are more have a self surveillance and always somehow uh, take the group more important as the individual. Yeah. I don't know. Um, it was a very common uh, thing to read last years. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, uh, maybe there could be the, the research in the future as it's coming yeah. <laughs> so present. Yeah. 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 Someone more? Someone else? I'm just I'm just wondering um, uh, if you could give a statement to um, abolition and the um, uh, the movement of the Querdenker in, mm -hmm. uh, in 
Germany right now, because like what they want or uh, on a very provocative level is to also um, uh, abolition, um, <laughs> abolish democracy in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course. See the connection. I would say that's a very like it's it's a very formal um, similarity. Yeah, of course you can say they are also in some way against the state, and they are against coercion in in, in a way, um, uh, not being vaccinated and so on. But um, I would still believe that that the similarity is so superficial. Like you know, right wing and left wing, they are both against the status quo, but they are very different for very different reasons. And and I mean, the core thing in abolition or in this abolition um, abolitionist movement that uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is um, solidarity and. Uh, uh, trying to, um, yeah, I don't know, to say Black Lives Matter means uh, fighting for a world in which um, uh, the lives of those that have been traditionally marginalized and excluded and abandoned uh, do matter and do count. And it's it's a fight for a world of, um, yeah, of equality and uh, and so on, and I think that's a very, uh, yeah, it's the opposite agenda than the queer Denka have. And I think if you, because of um, of the underlying ideology, I would say, and if you look at this movement more closely, I think you can see this even in the way they're formulating their critique um, of the state. Yeah, this idea of we are all sovereign citizens, for example, or you often see often very much racist and or racialized undertones, at least, and not to say that they are racist. Yeah, that there are certain, um, yeah, and there's a so, certain uh, social Darwinism involved, the idea of survival of the fittest and so on. And I think, yeah, so if you look at the underlying ideology is quite, quite quickly, you see how they are very incompatible. But I also don't want to dismiss the question right away because I think um, maybe there's something there also in terms of a danger of abolitionist politics or a threat or so, in that if you only, if you would only have this idea of destroying the state, yeah, if you would um, only have this negative element and say, well, the state is shit uh, and I'm uh, completely free without the state, then you might end up at a querdenker kind of position. And therefore, this, this second aspect, the positive aspect is so crucial yeah, to say abolition does not mean just abolishing something that has been there, canceling something, and then the rest stays the same. But also abolition is always a movement of creation and of um, inventing new possibilities and so on. And, there you can see, I think, what kind of institutions they are. Yeah, are they institutions that enable you um, equally and freely to participate and also independent of where you're coming from and so on? And so are they institutions of solidarity or are they institutions of exclusion and social Darwinism? And um, yeah, it simply means that you cannot stop with the negative element. You also have to have this um, positive uh, um, understanding of what the world should look like. Mm. Is there a specific example, contemporary example for abolition in Germany you could you could give? Um, <laughs> uh, it's yeah, I mean, it's, it depends on how broad your notion is. But I would say, for example, um, uh, the the climb, many of the climate protests yeah, where people uh, move in uh, in the Dannenroder Forst or in um, uh, uh, Hambacher Forst, uh, these can be seen in certain degrees as abolitionists because they um, are experiments in how to live. Yeah, so they try to establish a new forms of living together um, beyond the society, and they also are faced with police violence very often and try to push and, and combine the two. Yeah, so. Um, fighting back the influence of corporations in the state while at the same time um, creating new forms of life. 
but these are very short lived examples yeah they often times only are like a few days or weeks and not really um, long lived and I think if you want to look at yeah more stable examples maybe squats yeah squattings um, might, might be examples um, yeah so far I'm uh, um, fights about sanctuary cities oftentimes have this idea yeah where you where where people uh, in solidarity with refugees um you have again the same movement yeah you have this idea of um the negative aspect means trying to enable people to freely move and uh fight against the state violence of deportation and of uh imprisonment incarceration but at the same time, also come up with an alternative notion of cohabitation yeah, under this idea of sanctuary. A sanctuary is a, is a city where everybody is welcome, no matter where they're coming from and where they find refuge. And these are movements that you have in many German cities. And um, yeah, that I also find quite important. Um, and and for me, this is maybe the example that proves the relevance of abolitionism the most, yeah. Because then you have really the clear cut decision, and and this is um, yeah we witness this every day. How many people are drowning in the Mediterranean and these, or now in the Belarus, uh, Russian, uh, Polish border, people are uh, freezing to death. And if you're not if you, if you don't agree with this situation, if you don't agree with a situation where people die at the borders, then the only alternative is to reinvent our political institutions and, and, and create new, new forms of living together that enable people to, um, to be part of this, uh, this community, no matter where they're coming from. So I think reformist um, approaches are um are prone to fail and we have seen this many times and there you really have the decision abolition or barbarism i would say yeah, no? mm -hmm. yeah i think i mean uh i'm thinking because i'm just reading the uh, thesis again and there's the nice quote uh that language should repla uh, replace violence, but maybe that's more easier in smaller groups, which uh, for us it's easy because we are still some uh, and everyone on the screen uh, hopefully has a partner to speak to. <laughs> um, yeah, and we end here, I think, if there's nothing more. Uh, and thank you so much for coming to the Zoom. And I think um, you have the link. I will send again, what we do in the Lothringer will be on the website and of course, mm -hmm. um, there will be some online formats maybe as due to the situation probably so of course everyone is invited to to see the next steps and also if if, if anybody has more questions uh, or something that comes to mind now or only after the talk um, please uh, feel free to email me yeah i'm i'm happy to uh, provide reading lists or um, videos or books or whatever you uh, you're interested in or transformative justice um uh, contacts or so um my email address is can easily be googled so uh, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch if you if you uh, have additional questions great yeah. thank you very much yeah thanks for inviting me i'm, I'm very sorry that we cannot have a beer now uh, yeah. I, I have, have to drink it now on my own luckily we are some people here in the space and we have some beer for you <laughs> okay, very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Danke. To everyone and see you soon. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.